Please tell me what comes to your mind when you think of following names. You don't have to say it out loud. Just think, okay? What comes to your mind when you hear these names? Henry Ford. Jesus Christ. Albert Einstein. Your grandparents. Your, gra your grandparents. Um, Adolf Hitler. Charles Darwin. Karl Marx. Mohammed. Your mom. Your mother. Mark Martin Luther. Beethoven. Your dad. These are people who might be in your either Hall of Fame or your Hall of Shame. If, <laughs> um, um, regardless your feelings about each of them, they had an influence on the, on the generation after them. And they were hated by some, and they were loved by some, and I think they were followed by many. Uh, some of them created and invented, some of them tortured and terrified. But what connects them all is the legacy that they left behind. Yeah. The legacy. Um, they had an impact on the next generations and their influence will continue for generations to come. Good or bad. But there is a legacy. There is uh, an influence. What is a legacy? A legacy is something transmitted by or received from an ancestor or from the past. Um, today when we celebrate Father's Day, I guess is the proper moment to look back and to discover the legacy of a father. Maybe not your father, but a father. This man is not famous. And if I would ask you to tell me what do you know about him, probably you'll sit in and think, man, what? I don't know. He was not famous, but his son was famous. And he was the Apostle Paul. So today, I will try to uncover from the scriptures several things and the legacy that Paul's father transmitted to his son, Saul, who became Paul. So, just for fun, what do you know about Paul's father? <laughs> So we are right on, on the track. It's, it's okay. We are on the on, yeah on a, the good uh, one. The legacy of Paul's father. Who and this is the first question. Who was Paul's father? We don't know his name, but do we know anything about him? Yes, I believe we know. First of all, he was a Roman citizen, and probably he knew Greek language, or at least he was well versed in, in the culture of that day, the Greek culture, and he was a man of either high education or he wanted a high education for his son. Either he was, he had that high education and he said, I want for some, my son the same thing, or he always wanted something for his son, and this is why Paul was, he is who he is. Why I'm saying this, Paul and Paul's father was from Tarsus. Tarsus was located somewhere, somewhere in the southern, southeast corner of modern day Turkey. It's a land with so many uh, mountains. Uh, ancient Tarsus was a center of culture in Asia Minor. A center of culture. 
Um, for 300 years, like 300 years before Paul, uh, this city was the most important city in that re region. Um, Tarsus was known for producing world-famous philosophers. One of them was Athenodorus, probably this is the way you said the name of this kind of art. But he was the tutor of the first Roman emperor. The first, first Roman emperor was Augustus. So, uh, in, in the schools in Tarsus, they rivaled those in Athens and Alexandria. So, it was pretty um, cultural uh, city. Um, and also, what we know about, about his father is that he was a tireless fighter. Why I'm saying this? Because Paul, Paul's father, as well as Paul, they trace their lineage back through the tribe of Benjamin. What do you know about the tribe of Benjamin? One thing that you know about the tribe of Benjamin. Saul, the first king of Israel, was from Benjamin. And Benjamin was in the northern part of Judah. And Benjamin and Judah, they came back from exile. But the other ten tribes disappeared. So, why I'm saying this? Because when you read the blessing to Benjamin, the blessing sounds like this. Genesis 49, 27. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning, devouring the prey and at evening, dividing the spoil. Genesis 49, 27. Um, and we know from the history, from the history of the Bible, that Benjamin was indeed a wolf. Uh, and, and he was, and they, the, the entire tribe became known for their ferocity in the battle. They did later led the confederation of tribes, but then they lost the kingship to Judah. So you see, um, why I'm saying this because the tribe is a tribe. You, we know Paul. He was fierce, fierceless, right? I mean, Paul was stubborn, probably like his father. So, like father, like son. But both of them part of ben, the Benjamin, uh, Benjamite uh, tribe. Then, Paul's father was courageous. How do we know this? Well, because only this is the only way we think, and majority of people think, that he, Paul, obtained the Roman citizenship. Why? Because uh, Tarsus was a free city and was not a, a, a colony or a municipium, or something like that is in... in uh, in Latin, that means Paul's father obtained the Roman citizenship whether from some service rendered to the state or the emperor or by purchase. But we know he, uh, it could be, but it's doubtful because there is no price for citizenship. You pay by serving the state for 15 years. So being 15 years in the army and still alive, <laughs> you obtain your citizenship. So I don't think that was the case, though I probably, and a lot of people think the same, and, and I come to the same conclusion, that probably he rendered some, some service to the state or to the emperor, and it was like a reward. And once the, the, the parents have the citizenship, the citizenship was transmitted to the sons and daughters. So this is why Paul said, I was born a Roman citizen. Although he was a Jew. His father was a Jew. How do we know he was a Jew? Because he was a Pharisee. His father was a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee too, Paul. Um, and you know what? This is even, even I think, even more interesting. His wife probably he was she was a Pharisee too. 
Pharisees were a member of a party that believed in the resurrection and following, they followed legal traditions, but not the biblical ones, but of the elders, of their forefathers. Like the scribes, they were also known as experts of the law. Why I'm saying this, in Acts 23, verse 6, Acts 23, 6, Paul said this, Now, when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other part Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Brothers, I'm a Pharisee, son, a son of Pharisees. It's plural. So a lot of people think that even his mother was so into this lifestyle. So the whole family was into, uh, into this lifestyle. It was a lifestyle. It is, and, and he said it is with respect to, uh, to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. And you know what happened afterwards. But he says, I'm a son of a Pharisee. So he was a Jew, but also a Roman citizen. And he, he, he somehow, he, um, he was rewarded with this citizenship. And this is why Paul was born in Turkey. Interesting enough. Uh, probably that happened before Paul was uh, born. So, but we don't know this detail. We, we are not so sure. Also, he was a tent maker. Now, makes sense, right? Paul was a tent maker, but his father was a tent maker. Why? Because that was the tradition. Whatever I was, was my job and my vocation, I would train my sons into it. Do we have another uh, example like this in the biblical literature? Jesus, Jesus right? <laughs> Joseph trained Jesus, and Jesus became the carpenter of the, uh, of the village. Very good. So it's nothing weird to say that his father was a tent maker because he was training his son into this. Um, and probably uh, he was not just part of the trade, but most probably his father had his own company because he had a lot of money to send his son, not with him there at the school in Tarsus, but where? In Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. Um, look, uh, Acts 18, verse 3 says, And because he was the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they, made ten, they were ten makers by trade, Aquila and Priscilla, Prisca. So Paul was also a tent maker. His father was. You see how many things we know about his father? And all of them from the scripture. Now, he paid for the education uh, of his son. And his son, Paul, Saul at that time, he was educated by a well-known rabbi. Do you know the name of that rabbi? Well, very close. H-I-L-L-E-L. -L. Yeah, that was the grandfather of his teacher. How is, uh, come on, help us, Elaine. What was the name of his teacher? Gamaliel? Gamaliel? Yeah. Right. Who is this Gamaliel? Well, actually, he, Rabbi Gamaliel was, if you look at all the rabbis of that time, Gamaliel was here. Why? He was the um, grandson of Hillel, the, the elder, because there are more than one Hillel in their tradition. But this is the first one. The one, if you know, he is the, one of the most important religious leaders in, in Judaism. Uh, he was a scholar and he developed Mishnah and Talmud also. He was born in Babylon and then he moved in Jerusalem. And this is why you have Gamaliel in Jerusalem. Because the, the entire family 
stayed there with, you know, in Jerusalem. And uh, he was the founder of House of Hillel, and this is uh, one of the most important schools, at least was in that time. So Gamaliel was like, I don't know, like who in today's world? Someone very bright and very like, you know, with family, is from generation to generation. Um, and uh, the fact that Gamaliel took Saul and he, as his disciple is suggesting that he was from a preeminent family. Rabbi Gamaliel and Paul's father and mother, they were part of the same Jewish sect. And now Paul was part of the same Jewish sect, the sect of, or the party of, of uh, Pharisees. In Acts 22, verse 3, Paul said this, Acts 22, verse 3, I am a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but, but brought up in this city, ed, brought up in this city, he was not born in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, as all of you are this today, this day. You see, it says, he says, he was educated to the strict matter of the law of our fathers. Um, the, this, well, the Pharisees were not all over Israel at the same. Some of them were hypocrites. And Jesus told them, you know, you hypocrites. But some of them, they were really religious and really, they were trying to uh, fulfill the law. Gamaliel was one of them. So, now, um, another thing that we have in the Bible about Paul's father is that he had a large family. It was not a small family. Preeminent, but large. Um, why? This family was, his family was in Tarsus, Jerusalem, and also in Rome. You know that Paul was, at a point, he was uh, almost killed by a mob. But someone discovered the plan of that mob, 40 men. Who discovered the plot? Do you remember? He's Paul's nephew. Paul's nephew, which means... Paul's sister was in Jerusalem. So you have parents in Tarsus. How do we know? Because after his uh, conversion, Paul went back to Tarsus. His parents were in Tarsus. And probably while he was there, they became Christians. And then you have Paul's sister in Jerusalem. How do we know? Acts 23 verse 16. Acts 23 verse 16. Now the son of Paul's sister... Whoa. heard of their ambush so he went and entered the barracks and told Paul but now I said some part of the family was in Rome how do we know well this is why I ask you if you read the book of Romans believe me th there was a, an interest in that okay uh, how do we know his sister lived in Jerusalem but other relatives part of the family they were in Rome uh, Andronicus, Junia, and Herod, Herod, Herodium. Herodian, sorry. Uh, Romans chapter 16, verse 7. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. They are well known to the apostle. <laughs> they are. They are well known to the apostles, and, and, and I will give you another one. And they were in Christ before me. How about this? Paul was not someone who didn't knew the way. He didn't knew anything about Jesus. Probably he met Jesus. He, 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 his relatives were Christians before him. And he, who knows, maybe this is why he was so against Christianity. We don't know, but we, we can assume that. 
But Paul said that in Romans chapter 16, verse 7, and then in verse 11, he says, Greet my kinsman, Herodian. So, big family, preeminent family, kind of a rich family, but not super rich, and very strict in their religion. Reading all this information about Paul's father, we can conclude that he was a courageous man, he was entrepreneur, he loved his family, and he believed in the education of his children. He was very strict in his religion, and he always pursued for more and for better. He was a tireless fighter, pushing things to the limit, heading always to success. He was a strategic person, making plans and following the plans. And part of the, his plans was, you know, Paul in Jerusalem. This is why I'm saying this. His family was spread all over the empire, but he was in touch with them. Paul's father was a man of honor and honest, well respected by the others, with a warm heart and a, and a tough stomach. Maybe you think, okay, come on. I don't believe that you are just making it up. No, just wait. You will see. There is another thing in the scripture about his father, Paul's father. And he was successful and he fulfilled, and, and he was a fulfilled man. And Paul became the man he was because of his father. So when you look at Paul, he's standing with one of his foot feet on, on, on his father's shoulder. Now, what was the legacy of Paul's father? What was something that he learned from his father and he passed this legacy to the next generation, although he didn't have any uh, children, but children in faith. There is any scripture talking about this legacy, and I dare to say yes. So, please open your Bible at 1 Th Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10 to verse 12. 1 Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2, uh, verse 10 to 12. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward your believers, toward you believers. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encourage you and charge you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. How did he knew what a father, how a father looked like? Because of his own father. Oh, you, you want to know something about his mother? No? Yes. Yeah, okay. Let's, let's read... From verse 9 then. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to you, any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of, of God. Okay. It is. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affect, uh, affectionately desires of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. Working day and night. That was Paul. How did he learn how to take care of the church like a nursing mother? His mother. His father. Actually, this is a picture from his own family. Otherwise, you don't know. Or maybe he was paying attention of his sister with his nephew. But for sure, here in, in, in 1 Thessalonians, Paul is so 
warm and he, and, he, and he says, hey, I took care of you like my own family took care of me. Uh, Pat, Paul dealt with the church in Thessalonica as he saw his father dealing with him. As their, fa um, as their father in faith, he copied his father, his own father. He also copied his rabbi, Gamaliel, but a lot of influence was from his father's side. And, and Paul said, hey, I, I want you to have a righteous and a blameless conduct. Because that was he. Like, like years ago, he was like that. Um, this is not the first church writing, you know, things like that to that church, uh, Thessalonian church. But also Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, almost the same thing. 1 Corinthians 4, 14 and 15. 1 Corinthians 4, 14 and 15, he said, I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. The whole church was my children. <laughs> Imagine. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So he's considering the church, churches that he's planting his own children. And where to turn to understand, you know, what a father is, but to your own father. And um, fortunately, his father was a good, a good role model, model. There are fathers that are not good role models in this world. Um, and and uh, this conduct was, he said, holy, different, unique. Because his father was unique in the way he expressed this type of behavior. The word righteous and blameless. Two words, very important. In, in the, the, the first one, righteous means, and it's applied, uh, just to understand, the word righteous was applied to monocitizens in the Roman world. The word was about being upright, vertical, or just, or fair. Paul learned from his father how to be vertical and fair in all his conduct. Paul was not able to play the roles like an actor, like, like, a, like a hypocrite. He was not that type of Pharisee, a hypocrite. He was really serious. And the other word is blameless or faultless. And he said, you, you know what? I want this conduct to replicate in the church because I became like this because of my father and now I am your father in Christ and in the gospel. What Paul did specifically? Well, um, the expression of this holy and vertical and blameless conduct is in verse 12. He says, I dealt with each one of you. I dealt with each one of you. This means Paul was not using the same pastoral work, work for everybody, but his ministry was personalized and individualized during the three... Uh, we don't know how much time he spent in Thessalonica, but we assume a little over three weeks, and then he had to run. In three weeks, he dealt with each one of them individually. He, had, he took time to listen and to see every spiritual need. And he was exhorting them. He said, by exhorting you. The word means to call to one side, to summon, to invite, to appeal, to urge. Some people need to be invited to do something. And these people were there in that church. Little church. Three weeks, but Paul realized that there were some that they will never do anything until he invites them to. So he did that. He invited them with calm and confidence, like a father. And then he said, I encourage you. Actually, encouraging them. The word means to cheer up, to comfort. And there are some in the church, and in that little Thessalonian church, that they needed to be cheered up. 
so that they may act gladly and with passion. They needed like a, like, like a, like a primer <laughs> because they were not able by themselves. So he said, okay, I'll do this too. And the third word there used by him is charging them. The word means to testify, to affirm, to insist, or to implore. Yep, there were some brothers and sisters that they needed to be charged, to be affirmed, to be implored to do something, or to be. Uh, what Paul did, he did what he saw his father doing. He affirmed and he insisted. Why Paul did what he did? Because they were children in faith. And when, you, when, you, when I say the word children, you think of what? Like, cute, right? But also, immature. They were children. Cute children, but immature children in Christ. So, um, uh, he... Um, they, they didn't understand the, understand the Word of God. They... they they didn't understand the importance of a holy or a different life. So Paul said, I want you to encourage you, implore you, invite you to, war, to walk in a manner worthy of God. They didn't get the part that they must protect God's honor by living a, a life like, you know, in a manner worthy of their God. Paul was inviting them to live their life according to the future realm. You see what the verse says? The kingdom and the glory. He was thinking of the, the future, the kingdom and the glory. The rule and, 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 uh, and the radiant splendor of the, the kingdom of God should be manifested entirely in their life and was not. Uh, it was just, you know, three to four weeks. It's not much time. But at that point, the Thessalonian church was so immature, but Paul had a strong legacy. And you know what? He used it. He said, I have something to pass on. And he passed on that legacy to the church. I'm convinced that this passage is a great challenge uh, to all fathers. I don't know about you, but it's a challenge to me personally. I remember that attending a pastoral retreat, I was asked to influence uh, uh, to, to say who influenced uh, me the most during my ministry. And the requirement to, it was to say a name, or many names, and by what they influenced me. And that was, I never thought about that. <laughs> that was the first time when somebody challenged me to think. And then I started, you know, the first name that came to my mind was not my pastor, was not one of the, my mentors. The first person that came up in my mind was my father. Yeah. And the second one was my grandfather. Well, my, my father grandfather. In -law. Huh? Father in law. And then I thought, I started to think of pastors that they influenced my life or friends they influenced my life. And and then I realized that I, I have a name that influenced my life a lot. And I, and I said, I will never be like him. So it was not just the, you know, the, 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 the good part of it, but also the bad part. Um, and, and so you have your fathers or spiritual fathers or even your Gamaliels in your life that you become who you are because of them. Praise God for them. This is why I said, hey, if you... It would be nice to share with us a name or two, or two that they, you know, they really influenced your life. Celebrating the Father's Day, uh, my hope is that we will be able to pass the baton to the new generation of believers, exhorting them, uh, encouraging, encouraging them, even imploring them um, to have a righteous and a blameless conduct according to the glory and holiness of the kingdom of God. Either way, to our own sons and daughters, or to our sons and daughters in the faith, we should be able to pass on this holy legacy. Now, uh, the last point in my, my sermon was another question. How this legacy affected Paul's life? And this is very short. 
I realized that actually his life was entirely uh, affected. I believe that Paul's life was so deeply affected by this legacy that uh, he could never be the Paul that we know without it. When in Tarsus, he learned as much as he was able, and he used the culture in the Greek language that actually he employed later. It was a point in his time when he employed he, the Greek language, and they were like, whoa, they were amazed. As a Benjamin, he was a stubborn fighter. He never gave up, up but also he got some argument with Barnabas, remember? And, and that argument split them in two uh, teams, missionary teams. But he was a stubborn man. Uh, when a young man uh, was, you know, it was too much work for him and he went home, John Mark, Paul was so against him. But at the end of his life, he changed his mind and said, hey, send Mark to minister to me. Um, after he was flogged, he used his citizenship to leverage it against the Roman tribune. As the Pharisee, he learned from the most renowned teachers of the day. As a tent maker, he paid his board and room. As part of a large family, he was saved by one of his nephews. His life was saved. As a son, he learned from his father that what means to invite, encourage, and implore. And he did what he did to the Thessalonians and the Corinthian church uh, because of his father. Um, I, I really believe that in the time when he went back to Tarsus, remember Barnabas went back to Tarsus and he took him and he brought him in the, the uh, Antioch of Syria. So for some time he spent back, you know, with his family. Few years, we don't know how many. Some people say 10, some people say less. I don't know for sure. But he spent time with his parents. I really believe that they became Christians. I really believe that. Paul the Apostle is the man that he was because he was in Christ. But also, praise God, you know, for his salvation. But also, uh, next to Jesus, the next person who influenced him a lot was his own father. Um, and he influenced his ministry and his own life. We don't know his name. We don't know. Well, there is a variance, but I didn't want to bring it back. I mean, it's so complicated. And when I read that, when I did my research, it, it is from Flavius Josephus. It's weird. I don't believe that. It's, but we don't know his name. You know why? I don't think it matters. It's better to not know his name. That no name father could be you. That no name father could be for someone else. And, you know, we, if we don't have other children of our own, at least we may have children in faith. And this is the beauty of Christianity. Well, it's time to think of legacy. We have, we, we live behind for the new generations in here in church at B1. And this is our time. Um, if you are, I don't know, over 30 years old or 35, it's time to, to be a parent in, <laughs> a, a, a parent uh, in faith, in Christ, to have children, spiritual children. Um, and uh, let, you know, let's pray about this. Maybe after this moment we'll pray that God might give us opportunity and open us doors to become not just fathers and mothers to our own children, but also to spiritual children in faith.